When I was 15, I was mental around the craft of typography, but not because I was especially creative or my spelling outstanding. No, no, none of that. It was because my uncle owned a print shop. So there I was, waiting for destiny to take its course when the unexpected happened. My uncle didn't have a desk for me, nowhere to sit. And to make things worse, I had made it clear to my mom somewhere there that my career as a full-time student was most definitely coming to an end. So my family carefully assessed my talents and concluded that I wasn't shy to speak and that my counting was reasonably okay. And those were, at the time, the perfect ingredients for a successful career in finance. And that's how it all started in 1988. Now, fast forward 30 years, and I finally quit the industry. What had happened? Which, ins which sane, not insane, which sane person would actually do that? I'm sorry to disappoint you. There was no magic involved, no bravery. Nor have I made a big difference to anyone, no one other than myself. To my own surprise, people reacted to my change, and most of them very positively. That must have been tough. You were so brave. And some, they just stood on the sideline and said nothing and shook their head. But that's okay. As it turns out, some of the people who feel stuck in their job, they just cannot find a way out. And some of you in here might even know what I'm talking about. What you see then is an obstacle too big to overcome. And is it real? It sure is, but only in your head. So what does it take for you to move on? What does it take for you to make that one step? And what does it take for you to cross that invisible line? Let me share with you my own story of how I managed not to stand in my own way. Good afternoon, my name is Roman Eggenberger. I'm from Liechtenstein, and no, I don't own a bank. I run a coffee truck, and I'm an apprentice baker. Uh, I'll spare you the details of my CV, which contains a number of employers in the finance industry, a few promotions, 10 days of military service in the Swiss Army, and some time abroad. But eventually, my family and I returned back home to Liechtenstein a couple of years ago, and that's when the foundation of my career, or even my entire life, started to shake. In his great book, Do Pause, the author Robert Poynton calls change an emotion and not a list. So how does that sound to you? An emotion and not a list. Is that, is that encouraging or rather is scary? We've all been trained to take off to-do lists, and few of us have ever been truly rewarded for being emotional. So how do we reach that emotional change state? How is that done? Well, think of it as an expedition with an unknown outcome and lots of challenges and difficulties along the way, like cycling from Berlin to Beijing. You have to be well prepared, that's for sure. Now, we start off by believing that now is a good moment for change. And that's already the toughest part, based on my own experience. And I'm now addressing this to the men in the audience. They probably remember how they got to their decision to get married or become a father. Timing is never perfect, is it? We then have to create space to allow for new experiences to even be possible. And ultimately, we need to stay open in order to grab one of the many opportunities for change as they present themselves. So, why does timing matter? We all tend to save the best for last. Why do fireworks designers put the big burst at the end 
Why do we eat dessert last? Not here, by the way. And why do we wait for retirement to realize a dream? This phenomenon in psychology is called the peak end bias, which means that what you remember is different from what you actually experience. But it's not what I'm trying to get into. What is more important is that by focusing solely on a particular moment in the future, you miss out on quite a bit in the here and now. The last year, I lost my father, whom I hadn't spoken to nor seen in uh, more than 20 years. When I learned that he wasn't doing well, I decided to fly to Brazil and for the two of us to reconnect. It was the right thing to do, just not right then, because, as you would imagine, I had a few things to get done first. Within a month, he died. Instead of focusing your energy on regrets, now is as good a moment to start moving as it would be in four months' time. In order to actually move, we need space. Now, most of us in this part of the world feel reasonably free to move when it comes to our physical space. But what about time? Do you feel free when it comes to making use of your time? Or 24 hours a day or seven days a week enough to get everything done? Is time even about getting everything done? Two and a half years ago, when I was still in a finance role, I decided to reduce my workload in the office to four days a week. I didn't really know why and what I would do with that time, but it felt right. So I kept working more or less full time, just earned less, but I reserved for myself a very special privilege. I could take a day or a week or more time off to take full advantage of the right experience as and when it presented itself. And so I did. But how do we recognize the right opportunity? All that I can say is that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Once you've seen it, you cannot unsee it. So once you've stepped outside of your comfort zone, and you realize the magic that it can do to you, then you feel, and that's so important, you don't know, it's not about knowing. You feel when the next opportunity knocks on your door. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine was telling me about a fool's workshop in France. And he said, hey, Roman, you want to come with me? <laughs> okay, a uh, fool's workshop, south of France. He didn't, have, he didn't have a car, I had a car, so he's a 900k drive. Good weather, good food, good wine. Yeah, okay, I'll come with you. So I cashed in some of my extra days at work, and off we went. It turned out to be one of the most extraordinary days of my life. Never before have I cried or laughed as much during those five days. It was fabulous, life-changing in all aspects. But most importantly, it was my first serious conversation with myself in a very long time. But why would you want to speak to yourself? Lots of people around you that want to talk to you all the time, irrespective of whether or not you want that. But why you? We all tend to live a life where everything revolves around ourselves. There's a lot of me here, myself there, and I everywhere. To the point where sometimes it feels like it's too much. Now, I concluded for myself that those were actually my three biggest obstacles. So I had to get beyond me, myself, and I 
in order to move on. And that's what I've come up with. Number one, I no longer take myself too seriously. Not that I always did, but just trying to make that a point. Number two, I don't let others define me on the basis of what I do. I do respect my responsibilities as a father and a husband, but other than that, I am who I want to be, and that just evolves over time. Number three, I don't make it all about myself. So instead, I try to focus on what I can contribute to others. Number four, I don't always aim for more, because better and deeper can be so much more rewarding, especially when it comes to relationships. Number five, last but not least, I just want to live a joyful life, as there is more to it than just getting things done. And once you accept that you're just one out of close to eight billion, an ordinary human being, it takes a huge amount of pressure off, doesn't it? So Jonathan Kay, the 21st century fool, puts it like this. We're all nothing, but how to do it with ease. So having overcome my three obstacles, me, myself, and I, what did I do with my new freedom? A world of opportunities suddenly opened up. And to cut a long story short, I spoke to my wife and explained to her that I had to move on professionally. I spoke to, well, once she had signed off on our financial family budget for 2019, which didn't look nice, I pulled the trigger. I spoke to my family business partners, walked out of the office, and never looked back. So what have I been up to using my new antenna ever since? One of my best friends was deep into coffee, very passionate about it, had his machine, did all the courses. Coffee was a big part of his life. I only sipped my first espresso less than three years ago. But that's when he infected me with this coffee virus. And we bought a vintage truck in the UK, state-of-the-art coffee machine in the US, and now jointly run a mobile cafe in Liechtenstein. So, I'm an entrepreneur and a barista now. Another friend of mine, banker turned actor, inspired me to complement the mobile cafe with a mobile stage. And we launched and successfully completed a crowdfunding campaign to buy an old horse trailer and convert it into a mobile stage. It will host musicians, actors, and authors, and will be on tour later this year. So, I'm a stage director now. I then ran into a finance guy turned baker, and he was in need of help during the busy month of December. And I was a passionate amateur baker out of work. So when he said, hey, Roman, when can you start? We work seven days a week. You can sleep in the baker shop. And, you guessed it, there was a shower in the basement. I said, sure. That's what I'd always been waiting for. And I interned for three weeks and loved every moment of it. It was the toughest working period of my life, but it grounded me really solidly. And now we bake some of the bread for a mobile cafe ourselves. So I'm an apprentice baker now. About two years ago, I volunteered as a mentor on a platform called Vidain Canal. Once again, I didn't have much of an idea what it was all about, nor what would be expected of me. But one of the groups I was working with eventually set up their company to produce and sell edible hemp products. And they approached me and asked me if I knew someone who could help them with their finances. I threw in my own name and now act as their capital minister on a part-time basis. So, I'm part of a foodie startup now. Things are falling into place rather unexpectedly, but key to all of this is that I'm not just pursuing 
my own projects, I'm not just doing my thing. I'm spending most of my time with people inspiring me and looking for inspiration. People willing to change and helping others make change. People caring about themselves and caring for others. And people comfortable laughing about themselves and having fun with others. But most of those conversations aren't planned, so they happen accidentally or by lucky chance. But that's only because I've created the space for them to be possible. So what's next? I'm still trying to find my new rhythm in life. But in the medium to long term, my intention is to create a space that brings people together, allows for new experiences to take place, and that evolves into something the world, or at least Liechtenstein, hasn't yet seen. I've now walked you through three main points. Firstly, once you're ready for change, prepare the ground. Decide on timing, create space, and then stay open. Secondly, have a number of serious conversations with yourself and stop making it all about you, yourself, and you again. Instead, make new experiences rather than asking for good advice, reading smart books. And thirdly, there is a world of opportunities out there. And once you've seen it, you cannot unsee it. So let me be very, 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 very clear. This, all I've said, is not about me. Anyone could have done what I did, and lots of people do what I do now anyway. But still, a number of people have told me that they would do what I did if only they could. If only you could. Let me give you the bad news. Nobody else will ever come and make your change for you, which is not happening. The good news is, you're in control of your own change. Remember? Change is emotional. It's all happening within you. There is no line on the ground, visible or invisible. And I'm not saying it's easy, because it's not. But be bold, move on, and don't stand in your own way. Thank you.